I'm Matt Byron, and this is the Marketing Strategies Podcast, where I speak with interesting and well-respected marketers from high-growth companies. We'll discuss the strategies they've used to generate traffic, acquire new users, and grow their business. I know on day 30, if you are going to renew or churn on day 355. It's a little bit of mind control. You need to reach the leads in a specific time frame. The faster, the better. You know, when something works, don't do more like it, do more with it. If you're selling to a very finite audience, an inbound model is going to be grossly inefficient. This audience has what top questions, and then make sure that you have an answer to each of their questions. We don't hire professional writers to write for the blog. We hire sales operations practitioners. Whoever gets closest to the customer wins. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Marketing Strategies Podcast. Today I'm joined by Douglas Cook, who is Director of Growth at Skyscanner. Douglas has been with Skyscanner since 2013. He started out as Marketing Manager for UK and Ireland and has grown through multiple roles to his current Director of Growth position, where he's responsible for EMEA with specific responsibility for growth in their seven largest markets, UK, Russia, Germany, Spain, France, Italy, and the Netherlands. I'm extremely excited to understand the strategies, tactics, and channels Douglas and his team focus on to generate their phenomenal growth. So let's dive right in. How are you doing today, Douglas? Good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're very welcome. It's a pleasure to have you on today. Uh, It's an app and a piece of software that I've used a number of times, so it's really exciting to have somebody on from a product that you've used in the past. Great, glad to hear it. (laughs) <laughs> and so for the listeners and anybody who hasn't heard about Skyscanner, tell us a bit more about you know what you do and the problem you solve for your customers. Yeah, so Skyscanner is a, a travel search site. So we uh, currently cover uh, flights, hotels, car hire, and uh, more recently rail trains in the UK. Um, so we're a travel search site, free, unbiased, 70 million travellers uh, around the world currently using us to find the best deals on their travel. So we were started in 2003 here in Edinburgh and now have offices in a number of locations and teams in a number of locations around the world. I think we're up to about 10 offices globally now. And the travel industry is obviously hugely competitive, but flight, hotel and car search is also an extremely competitive part of that industry. How do you actually find that competition? It is a very competitive industry. I mean, I I think for us, it's about kind of how we stay ahead technologically. And we do think of ourselves as a we're a tech company that just so happens to operate in travel when it kind of comes to the principles of the business and how we operate. So that's about keeping us very much ahead of the curve in terms of the technologies that we develop and that we work with to keep ahead of the curve and keep solving travelers' problems, making travel as, as easy for them as possible. And I guess if you think back, 2003 is a long time ago. And you know, in a lot of our markets, we had real sort of first mover advantage and have kind of managed to keep ahead of that curve with sort of that tech focus that we've got. Yeah, and that's what I hear a lot from people and um, guests that come on this podcast is, that, you know, focus around product, make the product as phenomenal and as outstanding and as useful for, you know, the customer as it possibly can be. And that's what will keep that advantage. So that's effectively what you're saying there about uh, the techno- technological advancements and staying ahead of the curve, really, I guess. Absolutely, yeah. A little stat that I saw is that, you know, at Skyscanner, even in your first year with the business, which is a little while ago now, but you saw 50% plus increases in visitors in the UK and 100 plus percent in Ireland during your first year. You know, is that something that now you're working in EMEA and the, the seven largest markets? Is that something that you've been able to replicate and continue at Skyscanner? Yeah, so we're still a fast growing business and still going through uh, huge growth in uh, across all our markets. Obviously, the, the growth rate will vary according to market and there's some new ones we're just starting to break in now that are seeing significant levels of growth, albeit from a, a smaller base. But yeah, the business is still growing. Excellent. Good to hear. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And I guess before we move into the marketing strategy in more detail, I'd love to just understand. So it's helpful as a free online tool, it's helpful to understand where is the point of conversion for you? What's the point that a customer generates you revenue or somebody goes from being a a user to a, a customer for you guys? There's, I guess broadly, there's a couple of ways customers can book via us. We're uh, making a big push, uh, as you may have seen and read, into 
direct booking on our own site. So that is with us as the facilitator of the travel. The end booking is still with a provider. You know, we're not the the end travel agent or uh, or the the end airline, if you like. But we can facilitate that booking on our site. Or users also choose sometimes to to click out to a partner site and book via the partner. So they don't take the booking. We don't take the customer information on our site, but they click out to a partner to to do that. And it's at the point of booking then that you'll see revenue as well. Yeah, I mean, we have a number of different monetization models to how exactly we, we monetize. But yeah, that customer converting through to the airlines, what our aim is. Excellent. It's good to just understand that before we go into the marketing channel, just so um, you know, myself and the uh, listeners can fully understand for a free tool where somebody for you becomes a, a customer, I guess. So tell us about, a bit more about the marketing strategy. You know, what areas your team focus on on a daily, weekly, monthly basis? Yeah, so I, I guess it's worth giving a bit of a, a history to marketing at Skyscanner, if you like. So I guess in our very early days, it was all about SEO. And, and I guess the foundations of the of the business are still, or the marketing side of the business anyway, are, are very much in, in SEO. It's a real core strength of us. And that's kind of how we grew in those early days and, and driving a lot of our growth. Now, over time, as as we start to generate revenue that we could afford marketing activity, we, we kind of moved into more direct response digital type activity. Activity. And at, at the point I came into the business, which is 2013, we were kind of going through that point of, you know, looking for, you know, where's the next area we're going to to move into to continue to drive growth and tried a, a number of different tactics at that point of in time, tested a number of things. And it was kind of around about 2014 and then into 2015 that we sort of start to make this transition to growth as a principle as opposed to thinking of ourselves just as sort of top of funnel marketing and that was a pretty fundamental shift in our thinking as marketers as we were then and uh, you know very uh, big impact in terms of the ways ways we worked how we worked across the business how we kind of thought about our, our customers and travelers as well so that's kind of the the journey we've been on from from SEO to the introduction of paid and then and then on to on to growth um, in terms of our, our strategies I guess it's worth just giving a bit of background to where I sit within the business to help with some context here so as uh, as you've already pointed out I've kind of got remote over specific markets so we sit within the the regional growth teams and we are very much the voice of the market for France, for example, you know the, the the team we have in France are the ones that that are most focused on the French user and the French traveler and understanding what they need. And you know, globally, we will develop the product, we will develop the technology, we will offer solutions that will cater for uh, the majority of traveler needs. But really, that last mile is very much for the the local market to to deeply understand what that traveler needs that's different from elsewhere, and then help shape that not just the marketing strategies but the product itself and the whole you know the whole funnel thinking full funnel and um, as to how they they best serve the needs of the french traveler and how they best bring french travelers into the funnel in the first place it's a real kind of you know growth is a full funnel thing it's not just about acquiring users at the top it's like thinking thinking right from that acquisition point through to conversion and then how we bring those users back in the future yeah, so things will be done at a broad level from the global point of view, but then the nuances and, and specifics might be done by the local teams to make sure that it's actually talking to those countries and audiences specifically. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it can vary a lot by market. And that's kind of the approach we, we take is market first. And it's it's hard for me to kind of point to, a, you know, you say sort of summarize your strategy. There isn't like there's not one strategy fits all the needs of different markets, depending on the needs of their travelers, the media landscape, uh, regulatory landscapes, all these things shapes, you know, very different strategies and very different approaches in our in our different regions and they have the autonomy and the the remit to to do what is right for their market as opposed to necessarily follow a a, a global marketing strategy that we then just roll out to to each market is seo still a big thing for you guys because i did a, a, bit, a little bit of research on say similar web says you get just over 40 percent of your traffic from search and i did a little bit further research on using our uh, hrefs account and i see that you know although a, a lot of that might be for people actually searching sky scanner specific work uh, keywords there's also still a lot of traffic that you guys are getting from local guides or other 
pieces of content that you're creating that are search friendly uh, and useful to you know your audience so is that still a big area for you are you still putting a lot of time and effort into seo or has focus shifted further and further away from that no, that, like as sort of alluded to already, uh, search is still a massive thing for us. It's still very much the foundations of of the business. It, it drives a significant amount of our volume. Uh, I guess as most of the listeners will know that half the battle is is getting to the positions you're in, but you can't just then deprioritize and step away and expect to stay there. So there's a huge, huge amount of work from the teams just to maintain the strength that we've got. So yeah, search is, search is still really big for us. I guess another area that that we kind of see is quite, as we see is quite big, we know is quite big is kind of that direct traffic as well, which if you've dug into similar web, you'll probably kind of be seeing some of that. And that kind of comes from word of mouth and friend recommendation, but sort of almost the, uh, not your uh, your incentivized referral program type stuff, but like old school, hard to track, hard to see where it's coming from, word of mouth from having a great product and people telling their friends and, and coming direct back to you that way. So those are kind of, you know, two really big areas for us. I mean, as SEO is a particularly big part for you, as you mentioned, it'd be interesting to dig into that and then we can dig into the direct and partnerships in a, in a moment a bit further. So in terms of SEO, what type of content are you creating and what are you seeing work best for you? I guess there's kind of broadly two sort of areas that the the teams are are currently heavily focused on. So the first is, is much more transactional stuff. So uh, that can be anything from, you know, flights from Edinburgh pages to routes level pages for Edinburgh to London or London to New York, uh, airline pages as well. So things that are targeting users who are at, they might not know exactly where they want to go, but they they know where they're traveling from or they know the airline they might want to travel to, which can be particularly useful from a, a US perspective, potentially where they're highly loyal to particular particular airline so there's those kind of more transactional pages there which are kind of much further down the funnel Uh, but we do a lot of uh, more destination and inspiration type content as well which can vary from best places to go in in october or november and and i know our uk team have had some uh, you know had some great success with pages like that this like really sort of early stage i you know i know kind of roughly when i want to go away but i don't really know where i want to go and and they'll kind of serve up i don't know 10 destinations you can potentially go to with a bit of information about each uh to stuff that may- less posts are always popular <laughs> yeah exactly or, or and then other destination and inspiration stuff can be much further down the funnel you know maybe you've booked your your flights to barcelona and then there's things we can do to help provide you guides or information to help you when you get there so they're post booking but they're still giving value to the traveler and and still giving them a reason to come back to skyscanner as well so there's a lot of stuff we do in that sort of destination and inspiration area it's trying to add value i guess there so like you say uh, it's useful after you've booked but actually to know the area and to actually understand what you could do and and what it's like there is also a good value add for pre-booked as well Absolutely, and and for us as well, it's about shortening the the cycle time to to value and and for you know for an infrequent traveller, they might only travel twice a year if if that you know some people just take that you know one one holiday one flight a year which means you're 12 months from the next time you want to use skyscanner which for some people that could mean they've forgotten about us and then you need to invest money either directly with paid or indirectly with seo to bring them back again whereas if we can kind of shorten that cycle time to uh, from when they last got value to when they next get value by appealing to them further down the funnel then it might only be six months until they start their planning for the next trip so they're more likely to like to remember us and more likely to potentially come back direct and will you do that through like an email nurture campaign for example so someone uses skyscanner becomes a customer uh, you may send them some destination information would you then send them further information following that you know weeks months down the line to keep your brand in front of that person yeah, I mean, there's lots of different ways we we do that. Email is a uh, um, is a big one for that. We run push activity as well, both on mobile and we've tried it on on web too. Uh, you know, we've tested various different sort of content promotion type activities in the past as well, which is another way of getting information to them. But but email is probably the I say probably it is the biggest way that we currently uh, serve that information to people outside of uh, organic search results. 
Very interesting. And what I particularly liked about your articles is that they include a Skyscanner search widget, I guess, or a panel in there so that people, when they're actually reading the article, can actually use the product straight from within the article. I mean, I can't think of many other businesses that would be able to actually embed their product into an article and how valuable that possibly is. Yeah, and it's just about as making it as easy as possible. So if you have read something that inspires you or in, interests you, then what's the point in sending them back to the homepage to start them going through the funnel when you can just get them searching and hope, you know, in some instances, get them directly into the funnel right now. So you don't even need to input details in the search bar. But is there a button that we can put there that links you directly into the funnel with the best price to Barcelona if you've been reading about Barcelona, for example? Yeah, just making it relevant and as easy as possible, I guess. Yeah. And how are you deciding what content to create from the funnel, different positions in the funnel and different gaps that you may have, and also on a keyword level in terms of actually focusing on or deciding which keywords to focus on and target? The approach will vary depending on what it is that the teams are trying to do, but let's take the example of of what we can provide value for maybe further down the funnel, then the teams will be looking at the internal data we have to understand the current trends for for searches and and bookings and uh, where are people currently looking for, where are they uh, they booking for, and therefore that can help inform their, their strategy for what sort of content we might need to produce or promote there. Equally, if... I don't know if you were seeing, we do quite a lot of stuff round about travel trends type information. If you're seeing changes in searches to particular areas, then it it might inform you to produce some more early funnel stuff and destination and like kind of destination type content to encourage people into a new new trending destination as well. So there's lots of stuff. There's no kind of one answer to that question. It just depends what they're trying to do, whether they're trying to tempt people in the first instance or provide them value later and then there's lots of internal and external data that we can pull on to help inform that. And are you focusing around specific keywords so writing for potential opportunities in the search engines and then building value around that or is it really value first search second? I think value first, search second, and and I think Google would say that in any sort of guide they would ever give you is first and foremost, they want to know that you're giving value to their users and for us that we're giving value to our travelers. So eventually, if you give if you give that value and the user likes what you're getting, then uh, then that will positively impact you from an SEO perspective. Fantastic. Well, I just wanted to take a slight departure from uh, the specific ways that you market your business and just take a slight detour onto something that I read recently on your LinkedIn page, which is an article that you've written around lean and agile marketing and the specific process that you've developed around lean and agile marketing around testing, experimentation and learning before going all out on a campaign in in a big way. I mean, could you tell us a bit more about that? Could you educate the listeners about, about your process, how that works and what it does for Skyscanner? Yeah, no, absolutely. So this is an area that I've got a lot of interest in and I've been pretty heavily involved in over the last few years. And so this kind of goes back to the 2014-15 point, which I alluded to earlier on, where we were kind of looking at, well, where do we go for our next step of growth as a business? And we kind of saw the this idea of growth hacking starting to gain traction in Silicon Valley at that point in time and people were talking about uh, lean and agile principles and kind of how can we bring these two areas outside of uh, outside of software engineering and project management and you know how can we apply them to, to marketing if you like so uh, there was no silver bullet is kind of what I always say there is there, there's no we didn't subscribe to one particular model you know we didn't just go all in on growth hacking or all in on principles of lean but we kind of took various bits of each of those principles and kind of mashed them together in in a way that that sort of worked for for skyscanner so there's kind of four four key areas that for me were really critical to that that change we made so the the first was we had to get the people and culture right because we were transitioning came from very different backgrounds and kind of 
teaching them lots of new skills and uh, lots of new capabilities. And you know, for me, it was like it was a massive departure from where I'd come from in a you know very traditional consumer goods organisation um, with a fairly typical brand team type setup. Uh, so you know, we needed to build the right teams, and we kind of you know f- followed what many will call the the Spotify model of squads and tribes. Although conscious that lots of businesses have squadified before and after, so set up those kind of cross functional squad teams was one of the first steps and then you know supporting our teams in in their development as individuals as we started to change the things we were asking of them and think further down the funnel etc that I, I spoke about before then the second area was how we start to introduce lean startup principles into growth and into marketing and as a business you know things like the lean startup are are very heavily read and and very much evangelized in the product side of the org and we were kind of looking at well how can we take those principles of build measure learn into into the growth side and prior to that you know we although we weren't producing necessarily big above the line campaigns like like some brands do we were still you know following a a fairly standard marketing development process of creating things big batch and sticking them out there and and just hoping for the best and of course you would have done the research beforehand and you might have done you know but most of that would have been desktop research or in a, a focus group whereas the principles of lean and agile kind of really focused us on like how do we make the smallest possible version of this activity and get it out in front of real users right now and see what it actually does to our metrics as opposed to just taking to a focus group or a small number of users and just saying hey what do you think about that so we very much took those those principles from the lean startup and about building mvps or minimum viable campaigns as we would call them in in growth and creating activity that way and then agile I, like the the principles of agile basically we just well we saw that the the software engineering side of the business was uh, was taking on a lot of the you know agile software development and from the agile manifesto but it was interesting when you looked in in marketing at the time my perception anyway was when people said they were doing agile marketing they really meant real time and that was something we were doing already and i you know i think for some businesses it was quite a change and uh, one of the most prolific examples i think when you kind of google it for great examples of agile marketing was if you remember when Kraft did the oreo tweet during the super bowl and the lights went out and they were they were just responsive to the situation they weren't kind of move, going from a pre-planned content sheet as to what they put out in social at that point in time but in reality we were kind of doing a lot of that anyway our social teams were already empowered to make decisions then and there about what was right for their content as opposed to having to plan it four weeks in advance but what we then found in in our research is somebody had already created the agile marketing manifesto and it's still there on agile marketing manifesto.org and there's lots of really good principles there about how you take the um, kind of the core principles of agile as it uh, pertains to software development and apply those in a in a marketing environment as well so a lot of that stuff we took from there and then kind of like say sort of mashed that up with with a bit of lean and then and then a bit of uh, a bit of sort of squads and tribes and came to i will call it the sky scanner model for for growth as opposed to being as i say subscribe to any one of those three different approaches yeah and you've always got to do it in your own way haven't you you know you can't just mold yourself to fit uh, what works for somebody else so and um, that makes total sense but how long did that take to implement in that case because it sounds you know whenever you make culture changes within a business or start to move in a different way like that it can take time to implement was that something that was difficult to get people on board with or was it a straightforward process yeah it was difficult I don't know how long did it take. I guess it's are these things ever finished? Because there's always evolutions. There are things that don't work. You know, there's <laughs> there's things we've learned along the way. I I would say we're in a great place, but I wouldn't say we're finished. And because we're still making ad- adaptations to the model, but yeah, it took time, and I think it took a lot. You know, it's not just about growth in terms of growth marketing or growth hacking but it was growth in terms of growth mindset as well that that we needed to be open to to try new stuff because you know like i said for somebody like me this was a massive shift versus how i was previously doing stuff and had spent you know seven years doing stuff in a consumer goods type role so yeah it was a big shift and it took time 
And it's interesting on uh, the article, if anybody who hasn't seen this article, go to Douglas Cook's LinkedIn profile. And on there, you'll see this article, Developing a Lean and Agile Marketing Process. But one of the things that you've got in there is a great example of a, um, a banner, simple, straightforward banner of a Tenerife beach uh, with a temperature and a benefit statement. And it says Tenerife. And then the next one down uh, has the temperature and Tenerife but doesn't have the benefit statement and the third one down is just Tenerife with the picture of the beach and it's almost like this is how you learn along the way. How many of these experiments would you be running at any one particular time and how does that work for you? <laughs> how many? I don't know. I lose track. It kind of depends. I mean different teams will have different levels of throughput. At, at the point in time where we ran that particular one my team in any given sprint might be pulling in kind of four or five six particular ideas in a in a four week I think we were running in four week sprints at that point in time. So we were kind of taking four or five or six things. Typically like only one, maybe two at a push of those things would succeed. And the rest you were kind of weeding out with uh, with your small scale test pretty quickly. So you were only launching at scale, you know, perhaps one, if even one thing per month or per per sprint, but but you were trying lots of different stuff, lots of different stuff along the way. That particular example, I think, is like it's interesting you pick up on that one because that's still the one I I give as sort of a really nice textbook example of how the principles of lean can can work for marketing and work for growth. So that particular one, the idea was that you know if we had a dynamic temperature feed in our ads, then it would really appeal to last minute bookers who you know as it often is in Edinburgh, it's cold and raining. But if you knew it was follow the sun, yeah, twenty <laughs> degrees in Tenerife that weekend, and you can get there for a hundred pounds, then you might get that last minute booking now. There's loads of different tools out there, like you can get weather feeds from probably a million and one different places, and there's loads of dynamic ad solutions that you can build those into. But all of those would have taken time, not very much time, but they would have taken time. Whereas we sit at a pod with our design team and with our growth team, and so we simply said to them, we went to the weather channel one morning and said, okay, it's 18 degrees in Tenerife this weekend, and the current cheapest flights from Edinburgh are x pounds and they'd update the ads and then we'd run that for 24 hours and the next morning somebody would go back to the weather channel and they go back to skyscanner and they just update the temperature and the price and we just that was that was our mvp was just manually checking it on the weather channel as opposed to building that dynamic feed which would have taken time or money if we were having to build something so super lean super agile just to to get an idea out there and test it quickly and that helps you validate whether that's even a, a way to go, whether that tra- temperature is something that's actually going to sway more people than less people and actually test that quickly. So, yeah, that totally makes sense. What channels are you focusing on with these campaigns? I mean, this that we're talking about here is a it looks like a banner ad that would be used for, uh, I guess, retargeting perhaps or, or actually um, audience engagement online. Is that correct? And do you also use uh, social for some of these tests as well? Yeah, so that one was so long ago, I can't even remember what channels we use for it. I remember it in terms of it's a nice principles of lean and agile, but as for the detail of the channels, I can't remember. We're pretty open, right? For something like that, the, the teams need to pick the channel that they think is best for that particular idea. You know, if they want to, to use paid search, if they want to use social, if they want to use any of our in-house channels, it's up to them to work out what is right for them in their market, for their travelers and, and for that particular activity. We have access to a huge number of channels and you know most of our teams are empowered to use those channels themselves so it's not like we're having to wait for an agency to do that or uh, you know to, to pitch that to somebody it's you've got the password you've got the login for that if if you want to go and try it in that particular channel then go and try it yourself and, and see what happens and then what would you hold the campaign success to would it be are you looking at cost of user acquisition or uh, you know other other metrics you know what what are your um, um, metrics it will vary slightly by activity ultimately our north star metric is looking at, at what value we create for travelers and for partners and we do that through looking at the total transaction value that is facilitated through skyscanners that's our north star but there's multiple like there's loads of different ways of of getting to that you know so sometimes we will be looking at acquisition activity sometimes we'll be looking at the most efficient way of retaining people and bringing them back to site sometimes it'll be about funnel sessions so again it'll vary and it'll it'll vary according to the stage each market is at as well an early stage market may be wanting to 
to acquire more users to really kind of start to get that flywheel turning. Whereas there may be markets that have a particular channel with uh, ch- channel challenge even uh, with the retention and it's about kind of retaining users that they're acquiring quite successfully but where we all kind of converge is on that total transaction value is our north star metric uh, right at the the end of the funnel previously we were talking about seo and now we're talking a bit more about direct response what would be the lead time from somebody seeing one of these campaigns like your tested campaigns like an advert on social or uh, retargeting around the web for example what would be the lead time between or typical lead time between somebody uh, clicking on one of these ads and actually booking do you typically see that that happens almost straight away you know within the same day for example or is there a longer time where people would actually think about and plan their holiday and then book later date yeah it can do it it can be in that same session and i think this goes back to the when we were discussing seo and how the fact that we've got like transactional stuff that's trying to fulfill travelers who know where they want to go know where they want eh, sorry where they want to go when they want to go and then stuff like that you know it can be same session like an impulse really i guess uh, well, not even impulse, because they may have they may have spent ages researching it, but for whatever reason, they haven't come across Skyscanner. We need to remind them about Skyscanner uh, when they get to that point of purchase. Whereas some of the other content uh, that we talked about is, you know, can be about more destination and inspiration. That's early funnel. You know, they may be weeks or months away from making that purchase. So it's about kind of serving their needs right then and there, which is I just want a bit of information about where I could go in October and then kind of keeping feeding them information as they go through their thought process and their consideration process. So when they get to purchase time, they they remember Skyscanner. Very interesting. And then what tools are you using to to track, I guess, your experiments and to understand which are being successful at what rate and then how to actually progress the ones that are looking positive to a, to a, a bigger stage? Uh, uh, lots uh, and it's kind of a combination of external and internal tools you know we've we've built a lot of our attribution models and that sort of thing in-house uh, in terms of specifically on how do you track what's working uh, and and what's not and, and what do you want to scale that's a challenge with the size of team we've got because there's a lot of people doing a lot of stuff and at any time there can be hundreds of experiments going on It'd be really interesting to know if there's any sort of juicy takeaways, I guess, or some things that you've gone, wow, that's worked better than expected. You know, the the campaigns that you've run and that you've seen or tactics that you've seen other people use that you've tested yourself and you've thought, wow, that's really worked well. You know, I guess what I'm after is what campaigns have worked particularly well for you over the last few years? And is there any takeaways from that that you could give to the uh, listeners? One that I think is, I guess this goes back to a general operating principle, but then I've got a specific example that that I think illustrates it is when we when we kind of squadified and and made the teams autonomous to take the decisions that were right for their market one of the things that they needed to make decisions on was well when's the time to right time to run an activity uh, what is the right way to do it in your market and and previously we would have created an activity centrally everybody would have like ticked a box on a spreadsheet say yes no we don't want it they would have done some translations on the spreadsheet as well to adapt the kind of the core collateral and and often you would have just rolled it out at the same time because uh, there was efficiencies of doing it that way or you're reliant on data you know that needed to be run to inform the campaign so specifically on something like our best time to boot campaign which is very successful way of informing users on the best time to boot to get the best flight prices from their country to popular destinations destinations so something like that we used to run in in january of every year now when we said to teams it's up to you to run this campaign how you want it and when you want it some markets like the uk will still go we'll still do this in january because this is the point in time where we believe travelers most want to know this information whereas markets like turkey go actually we're going to run it in july january was never good for us we just did it in january because we didn't have an option because that's when like that's when the majority wanted it so but now we can do it exactly how we need it for us we're actually going to we're going to change the time completely of when we do it we're going to change uh, the assets more we're going to adapt it more for for local needs so if you look at a campaign like that we don't get the big bang we used to you know we january we used to see a massive 
a massive spike in, in users from this activity. So we don't get that anymore. But if you look over the course of a year, we get a much more sustained impact from, from that activity than we used to by empowering the markets to take the decisions that are right for those markets as opposed to just saying everybody has to do it at once and making it kind of a, an opt-in or out kind of thing. And I guess that talks to what we were uh, discussing earlier about actually having the local markets be agile and uh, be able to adapt to their local customer because, you know, there's differences of culture all around the world and being able to actually adapt to the specific uh, interests of your local markets must be and clearly is really, really important for Skyscanner. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's a big part of how we operate. And, you know, it's it's in company goals, it's in team goals as to uh, how we win in each market individually, as opposed to just thinking, how do we win in aggregate, which could mean one market like smashes it out of the park, and another market is kind of propped up by that market that is smashing it out of the park, if you like. So what are the marketing strategies that you're going to be focusing on in 2018? You know, what's on your radar? What's big? What's uh, going to be important for Skyscanner moving into the rest of this year and then 2019? So I guess the main thing is how we, and I keep going back to this point, is like it's not necessarily about having a strategy that I can say that Skyscanner overall is going to follow, but it's how we continue to make sure we learn as much as we can about travellers in our market and continue to make sure that the entire traveller experience from right from the point of acquisition right to the point of purchase through the full funnel is is adapted to meet the needs of travellers, whether they're in France or Singapore or Brazil and and that our, our local teams, which is very much, as I said at the start, where my remit is, are, are the voice of the traveller in those markets and doing everything they can to make sure that, that Skyscanner fulfils travel needs there'll be a combination of stuff we've done before and we've talked a lot about seo and and that is still kind of a you know a big area for us but we'll also keep trying new stuff new ideas new creative ideas new channels as well a lot of those over the second half of the year i won't even know what they are yet as is the way quite often when you're as agile as as we are we may not know one month the next exactly what's coming but we'll also be looking for for new ways to help solve travelers problems and 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 help bring more users in skyscanner that makes total sense as well. Um, and it rounds up what we've been talking about nicely. So I'm going to bring this to our last five questions, which is five quick five questions that I ask every guest that comes on this podcast. So first up, what's your best piece of marketing advice? So I struggled about this one. Obviously, I did know you were going to ask me this one, but I still struggled on it because I guess it depends what you want advice on. So I'm, I'll, I'll kind of say this from the angle of what a lot of people have come to me to ask about is, you know, they've seen a lot of stuff on how Skyscanner's Skyscanner done lean and agile and growth. And, you know, how do I do this? How do I do this for my business? And and I think regardless of whether you're a tech business or a traditional business and you, you want to make a change to be more agile, to be more lean, you know, to introduce principles of growth, whatever it is you want to do, the first part has to be to get the culture and the people piece right. And if you only do one piece, sort that bit. And if you're doing it all, then start with that bit. So get the structure right. Make sure the people are supported and whatever change it is you're you're going to make would be the first thing I would recommend to anybody coming and asking, how do I apply some of these principles in, in our business? Yeah, that makes sense because then everyone's pushing in the right direction or the same direction, should I say. Uh, everyone's bought in. Everyone's got that culture of you know lean and agile and growth, really. So I can totally see how that's um, important to do at the start of the process. Absolutely, yeah. So number two, can you recommend a book to our listeners? Yeah, so I'll give you a couple. So the first one, actually, I'll give you is based on everything I just said, which is Growth Mindset by Anne Dweck, because I think a lot of what people need to go through when you're making changes is that they are willing to to learn new things and growth mindsets are a great book in in that regard so the second one that really helped me when we guys kind of went through the change was growth hacker marketing by ryan halliday now some people look down their nose a little bit at this one i've kind of found especially when you see it at conferences because it it isn't the most complex and it isn't most revolutionary when you look at it now but where it really helped me is like Ryan was kind of coming from from a place that was very similar to where I was in terms of consumer goods and kind of taking going through his journey as to to, to what he knew and, and where he'd been and then how growth kind of differed from that was like it was super helpful to me in terms of uh, my mindset shift and my my transition. So I really like it in terms of a, like as a first book, if you've not done 
growth if you've especially if you kind of come from a more traditional marketing org then uh, it's a great place to start to understand what what growth is all about and how that differs to marketing yeah i've read um, ryan holiday's book it's a short book it's an easy read and it's like you say it really gives you the introduction to thinking about growth hacking really in that way uh, it, i agree i think it's a great book you know i think it's a it's a, it's a straightforward book that gives you a, a good guide in terms of you know almost an inspirational book in terms of you know where you could actually focus your time and, and, and a direction to move in so a great choice from my point of view absolutely so number three is what software tool could you not live without? Well, obviously, I've got to say Skyscanner here. I can't say anything else, <laughs> um, which might, I, I don't want to do. So I'm, I'm not being sycophantic uh, or not being completely sycophantic about this. Uh, I guess the other thing as well is like, let's face it, we could do our jobs with pencil, paper and a telephone, right? So if all I had was one piece of software, then I need to experience what our travelers are experiencing. I can't market something that I don't know how that is. So I need to be able to experience Skyscanner and go through the, the pain points there. And then everything else, if I had to, uh, I could do it without any tool. I could just do it with a, it'd be longer, but I could do it with a piece of paper on the telephone. Well, is there a software tool that you use on a daily basis that is, is always open on your computer? Slack is probably the one that is absolutely always open at any one time. Um, there's loads of stuff which is open most of the time, but Slack is the one that is definitely open all the time. Cool. And uh, what's your favorite example of a marketing campaign? This was an interesting one as I was kind of thinking about this, and it I don't know, it, it kind of got me thinking a little bit deeper about it because if, a lot of where I tended to go to was kind of some of the, I don't know whether it's called them golden oldies, that makes me feel old as well. Like some of the <laughs> big kind of, you know, back in the day of like Guinness, you know, things like Guinness and, and uh, Prancing, it was Prancing Horses or whatever that one was called, and it was more than an advert, you know, it, it dictated music choice and left field, you know, it was kind of a big thing, I think, in left field, the band becoming popular at that point in time, but, you know, it was it was kind of a cultural piece, not just an advert, probably as much uh, a factor of the fragmentation of media landscapes and that sort of thing that adverts often tend not to get that level of impact uh, these days, but to me, kind of stuff like that still feels really inspiring, stuff that has an impact more than just selling more Guinness and and I believe it did sell more Guinness but it, it has an impact on on culture as well I think there's some stuff still does that you know the John Lewis ads it you know it's probably a bit of a cliche to say hey John Lewis ads and which for those of you in the states that will mean nothing but Christmas ads but it's probably kind of the one you know it's still something that people look forward to it's still something people talk about and well I personally maybe don't get culturally as inspired as that as I did by the likes of Guinness back in the day. It's still something that 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 doesn't just drive sales, but it kind of makes us it makes a bigger cultural impact than just a, a marketing piece. Yeah, I mean, true ads are more than just ads, really, aren't they? They're actually, you know, as you say, they influence uh, music and culture and make you feel good as well. So, um, I agree. I actually went to the um, the Guinness factory in in Dublin not so long ago, and it's um, yeah, they've got a whole section devoted to the advertising that they've done over time, and there's some fantastic uh, pieces that they've done. Yeah, no, absolutely, I I agree. And finally, uh, which other podcasts do you listen to? Sorry, you've got two two weeks in a row where people have said, I don't listen to podcasts. I don't listen to podcasts. I kind of find uh, <laughs> I, it's just the time. Like I, I consume most of my stuff on blogs on my phone in like stolen moments where between screaming kids or sitting in meetings. So to get the time to sit and listen to podcasts, I find quite hard. So I will consume like five minutes worth of information on the phone while I'm sitting putting my son to bed or when I'm sitting for somebody who's late for a meeting. So that's how I consume all that information. Whereas finding that time to sit down and and listen is quite hard so uh, yeah sorry uh, obviously i listen to i will listen to this one um, and i listen to your future ones but yeah <laughs> it's i'm a big kind of i'm an avid blog reader and i use twitter a lot to kind of just sort of you know it's like almost like a rabbit warren of you click on one thing and another thing and another thing and you find new people and find new stuff to read so that's kind of how i consume a lot of my uh, a lot of my information on growth and marketing Cool. Yeah. I mean, and everyone consumes media differently as well. So I think that's the, the beauty that we've got these, these days with the, you know, the digital landscape is being able to have audio for people that love audio and lots of different blogs and ways of consuming that for the people that love to do that as well. So absolutely. 
it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today, Douglas. Um, thank you very much for your time. It's been really nice to hear about Skyscanner, your experience, and uh, you know what you're doing with Lean and Agile marketing. So uh, I know there's a lot of takeaways for the listeners. Um, if anybody's got any questions, please feel free to get in contact with us through any of the channels, uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, or directly by email. And if anybody want, wants to see the show notes, we've got links to all the books and everything that we've mentioned in here at mattbyram.com. So thanks again, Douglas. Really appreciate your time. Thanks very much, Matt. It's been great to speak to you. Thank you all for listening today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share with your friends. I'd also be extremely grateful if you could rate and review us on iTunes or the channel you get this podcast through. Until next time, I've been your host, Matt Byram. Matt Byram.